Hello, welcome back to Soteriology 101. Today you can see we have a guest with us. This is Dr. Ken Wilson, uh, who is a MD. He is a, a orthopedic hand surgeon, but he also um, is a, a PhD, has a PhD from Oxford. Uh, who He wrote his dissertation, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Wilson, but you wrote your dissertation on uh, Augustine's, uh, St. Augustine's uh, views, his teachings, um, I know that you're one of today's foremost uh, Augustinian scholars. Uh, you've not only read all of his works, you've actually read all of his works in chronological order and then wrote an Oxford dissertation on the subject. And you're a medical doctor. In other words, you're one of those really smart people that we have to really listen to very carefully to understand what you're saying. Is, is, that, is that all true? Is that, is that accurate? Well, most of that's true. Yes, I uh, I like to say that uh, when I put in the beginning of my book, I don't consider myself smarter than anybody else. All I did was follow the instructions Augustine gave on how to find out what he taught, uh, and he said you need to read it in chronological order. And and it is just surprising nobody sat out and did that to figure out where he went. So all I did was follow the instructions. All right. Well, there you go. Well, I had you on the program because I want to know more. I know you taught as an adjunct professor there at, at, at Gateway Seminary, um, and so you've 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 been tied into a, a Southern Baptist to some degree. Uh, you currently um, are associated with and teach with what school? Is it Grace? Grace uh, School of Theology. Grace Sorry. School of Theology. Um, and so tell us a little bit about your, kind of your story. Maybe just start there and talk about what you learned through this process and just take us through, us, uh, through it, and then I, I may interrupt with a question or two as we go. Sure. Well, when I went to Oxford, the uh, goal was to study Augustine and to find out uh, why he changed his views. Um, that's a pretty common, uh, commonly known fact among the scholars that he did change his views from a traditional view of free will and then he went to a more deterministic uh, type of viewpoint. And the question is, when did he did it? When did he do it? And why did he do it? And so that was the goal to find out what exactly happened. And to do that, you have to go start at the very beginning of his work and read through the very end of his work and all of his epistles, all of his sermons, everything he wrote that's still extant. Uh, some things are, are missing. We don't have them, very few of them. But most we have, and you have to read them in order. Okay. Well, what did you discover? The interesting thing was that almost every scholar uh, will tell you that Augustine changed his mind about 386, writing to Bishop Simplicianus in Milan. And the reason is, is he starts off with a traditional view, and in the middle of the book, he switches to a more um, serious view of God's sovereignty. And then it suddenly disappears for about 15 years, and he's using the same defenses and traditional Christian arguments. And then all of a sudden in 412, he jumps up with this new theology, and you can see him birthing it. And um, the interesting thing is, everybody assumes, because that first one in 396 was there, that it just kind of sat there for 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. I, I found that difficult to believe, that he had amnesia for 15 years, and then uh, picked it up. So my dissertation points out that he actually went back and revised part of that afterwards. He also did it in four other books without announcing it. So it's not a, um, an unusual thing for the author himself to go back and revise something right. uh, after he's written it. Right. Now, my understanding, of course, he, him being formerly a Manichaean Gnostic, what, what does that mean for those who don't know what a Manichaeanism is, Gnosticism is? Um, I've been accused of, of you, know, you know, being too polemic by referring to Gnosticism as, as, as being similar to some of the claims of Calvinists. I, I don't think anyone's saying that Calvinists are exactly like the Gnostics of the 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries by any means, but there are some similarities. Um, with regard to the concepts of determinism. Talk about that a little bit. Help, help our listeners understand what Gnosticism was in that day and, and how uh, maybe uh, Augustine was influenced by his former roots in Gnosticism. Sure, Lady. The interesting uh, part of that is that my very first chapter in the, in the thesis goes through all the ancient philosophies and religions on their views on determinism uh, versus free will. And the Gnostics were famous because they believed that things were already set, that they were dualists, that everything physical is good, everything that is spiritual, I mean, everything spiritual is good, everything that is physical is bad. 
and people were predetermined to heaven or hell, the elect versus the non-elect. Um, same thing with the Manichaeans. Now, the Manichaeans have been known as the pinnacle of Gnosticism. They're the, the, the greatest uh, group that came out of Gnosticism. And the Manichaeans taught the similar thing that God, uh, there were two, e a good God and an evil God. The evil God created the world. Um, you can have all the sex you want with anybody you want and then not be a sin. But if you conceive a child in the womb and bear a child, that's a sin because you've brought evil into the world, becomes something physical happened. And that child at birth is damned because he is physical. And so the, the good God has to awaken the dead uh, sinner and then infuse faith into the sinner in order to resurrect them and have them believe. Uh, infusing faith into them. Uh, that was the view of the Manichaeans. And you're right that uh, Augustine spent 10 years as a Manichaean. Most people say nine. Uh, Chadwick and others are correct that he actually spent 10. Tell so me. he was very versed in that Manichaean doctrine. Well, it sounds like to me, even hearing that, there's a lot of similarities with the, the conflict of that day, which it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I don't consider myself to be a scholar on all of those uh, historical facts, so correct me where I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken, but my understanding from the, the studies I have done is that the bigger, the bigger argument of that day had to do a lot of times with baptism with regard to infants um, and, the, and the whole concept of this corrupted nature from birth and you have to do something about that. And it seemed to kind of relate to what you were talking about with regard to Manichaeanism, um, is that there are the, the issue of this, 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 this evil child now that you have to do something with them. Um, and so baptism was in a sense, infant baptism was in a sense, a way to handle or a way to deal with this corruption of the child from birth. Um, is that accurate? Um, is that is that kind of what birthed out of this, these debates and this argument was the the concept of uh, credo baptism, uh, or, exactly or baptism yeah, versus credo baptism? Yeah, you're right on. Um, so, in the early days of even as early as 200, Tertullian said, "Why are we baptizing infants? Why don't we wait until they're old enough to believe?" And so. There was baptism that happened, we know very early, but nobody knew why. Even Augustine, about 400, did not know why infants were baptized. But what happens is, in 412, he gets into argument with Pelagius over infant baptism. Uh, and so he says, wait a minute, um, you have two infants. One is a baby who is born on the street by a prostitute. The other is a baby born of Christian parents. They're both sick. The Christian parents rush to the baptismal font they don't make it. The baby dies in the arms of the bishop before it's baptized, and that baby goes to hell. The other baby from the prostitute is rushed in by a virgin. It's baptized, and that baby's saved. Of course, they believe that actually putting the baby in the water in the baptismal font was salvific. They received the Holy Spirit at that point. And so he said, what's the difference between the two? It can only be the providence of God, that God decides whether a baby is saved or not saved, on based on whether that baby gets to the font, and he's the one who controls the circumstances. Therefore, it's not the human will that can save you. It only appeals for good or only appeals for evil. So God is the one who decides it has nothing to do with the human person. And that's the way he justified his argument was through infant baptism. Huh. So um, the, the debate wasn't really about so much about Calvinism, Arminianism, as we know it today, obviously, because that's obviously acronistic and in the sense that that's not until years later obviously but the whole debate that we have with tulip uh, sociology um, that's not really what Pelagius and Augustine originally were debating they were really dealing with the issue of uh, corruption of the of the nature of the child from birth um, right. and, and what to do with the corrupt nature and whether you baptize them or not so it, it seems to me Pelagius therefore regardless of what we think about Pelagius today or what we believed he was actually siding with many of us who hold to credo baptism today or to uh, baptism of believers today. Uh, it seems to me Pelagius was actually defending that perspective against Augustine's view of, uh, you know, baptismal regeneration of infants. Um, exactly. Okay. So and, and you're exactly ahead. right. And so Augustine's the one that came up with baptismal regeneration, that that is salvific for them. Nobody else before then, really articulated that way. 
And everybody believed in original sin. I mean, the dissertation goes through that. They believed in original sin as physical death, a sin propensity, and a weakened uh, moral sense. So what was added was the guilt, that it was damnable guilt at being born from Adam. And Augustine is the one who added that. And so you're right, Pelagius didn't understand uh, the, the baby being born as damned. He thought that they went to heaven because they had not sinned. Uh, and so everybody else believed that too. He, he had some other issues, but at least he was right on that, that aspect. And so when Augustine added the guilt of original sin, that's when people started uh, <laughs> complaining and saying, wait a minute, um, there's a problem here. Right. So, yeah, and we, we obviously talked about that before on our program as well. Um, Adam Harwood's book, I think, does a really good job of explaining Dr. Adam Harwood from New Orleans, for those that want to look for that. Um, and he speaks of the, the natural condition from birth of a child. Though uh, sin stained, as you mentioned, under the curse of sin and the environment of sin, uh, not guilty for the sins of our parents, as it says in Ezekiel and so many other passages that we're not held accountable or guilty for something that um, our parents have done, or our greatest grandparent did, but instead, as intuitively would be, I think, uh, accepted, that we would be held guilty for our own choices, uh, be accountable for our own um, decisions, not the decisions of, of those who've gone before us. Um, and so Augustine, historically, is the first one to really articulate this concept of original guilt um, with the concept of that we, we are born guilty because of what Adam does. Um, and I've often made this argument, correct me if this is, is, is right on in the right direction here, but when, when a Calvinist says, or a theistic determinist, whatever you want to call the, the label there, um, when they say a, a man is responsible for his choices, what they, what they really mean is that they are not able to respond willingly, but they are still culpable because of the imputed guilt of Adam. And so I've always tried to point this out because they'll use the same vocabulary but mean have a different dictionary. They mean something different by the word responsible or culpable than we do. So when I say a, a person is culpable for their sins or responsible for the sins, I actually mean they are able to give an account for their actions. They are um, of an age where they can give an account. They are responsible, which means they're, they have the ability to respond willingly or unwillingly to God's appeals. Um, and therefore, they're held responsible for their choices. That's what I mean about it. And that's what most people generally speaking, intuitively would think of the word as responsible. But yes. when an, an, an Augustinian, as taught by uh, him later in his life, uh, or a Calvinist says, well, no, 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 like, we believe men are responsible too. They don't mean that. What they mean is that men can't respond willingly or positively to God's offers, but they're still culpable or held guilty because of the imputed guilt from Adam's decision in the garden. Would that be an accurate assessment? Exactly, Leighton. And that's the Manichaean view. Uh, it came right out of Manichaeism. That's not a Christian view. And Augustine, with his 10 years, picked that up and brought it into Christianity to fight the Pelagians. Now, I've often argued that Pelagius is kind of become the boogeyman of, of the deterministic uh, you know, line of Christian thought. In other words, uh, those who have kind of lined up with Augustine have done a really good job at painting all of us uh, in the really bad, a really bad light, maybe even maligning a little bit of what uh, Pelagius himself taught, um, yeah. it, based upon some of the readings I have uh, from him, um, he does say that we need divine aid, that we need help of God, and and yeah. and, and several of his teachings. And so, um, yeah. I've always been taught that Pelagius believed that he was we were born good and without any problem. We don't need any of God's help, and that we can do all these good things. But reading Pelagius, he he never, at least from what I read, he never said that. And it seems as if the common practice of that day is if somebody was deemed a heretic or uh, whatever, they would they would often burn you and your your writings. And so much of what we have from Pelagius didn't survive. Um, and so it, it, he seemed to become this boogeyman, almost like Hitler is a boogeyman. He's a bad yeah. character. And yeah. so like in the political world, if I can link Donald Trump to Hitler, if I can link Barack Obama to Hitler, then I can make a case. Look, that guy said something that Hitler said once. He's a bad character. And yeah. we can do the same thing to Pelagius. We can say, look at what Pelagius believed. He was a bad character. And those dirty Arminians or those dirty provisionists or those Southern Baptist traditionals, those grace guys over there, those, those, those guys are teaching things that sound a lot like what Pelagius taught, 
Therefore, they're Pelagian or they're semi-Pelagian, if nothing else. They're boogeymen. <laughs> could we not turn that around? I mean, legitimately, could we not, if we were practicing the same principle, could we not call them semi-Gnostics? I mean, by that same standard? I mean, Oh, yeah. No, that's right, Leighton. And you're exactly right on Pelagius. The, the writings we have do support what you said, uh, having read them. And I point that out in my uh, dissertation. I also show that Augustine maligned him. He was the first one to make false accusations against him. Uh, in his, he was a polemicist and a rhetorician more than a student of Scripture. He admitted that himself to Jerome. So you have a man who's attacking Pelagius. There's a great book out called The Myth of Pelagianism uh, by Bonner. came out last year and discusses that whole issue. Uh, uh, expert, uh, just a, a great book. Now, is it true that uh, uh, Augustine was from Africa, Yes, North Africa. North Africa, and he did not know Greek. That's correct. He, matter, matter, if, if what I, I remember reading something about him having a really bad experience with a Greek teacher. I think he was abused by his Greek teacher or something, and so he just he kind of just wrote it off. I don't want to have anything to do with Greek anymore. Yeah. Um, What's well, interesting, if you read through his works, you can see where he just starts picking up a little Greek, and then he tries to insert some things. Uh, but it was after he, he switched to his deterministic theology that he started learning Greek. So he'd already made his move by the time he, he started to try to learn Greek. Huh, okay. Do you think that can impact? I mean, obviously, I, I believe in it, it can impact when you don't know the original languages or the culture. And a lot of people yeah. don't realize 300 to 400 years after the writings of the New Testament, that's a long time. Um, three, 400, three or 400 years ago here where I'm sitting, I would have probably been surrounded by Cherokee Indians. Okay. Yeah. Do you think about how much has changed in the state of Texas in the last three to 400 years? Think about how much change from the time that Jesus walked the face of the earth and the apostles wrote the New Testament and when Augustine, a Manichaean, former Manichaean Gnostic from North Africa who did not know Greek, came in for the very first time and by John Calvin's own admission, taught something that was unique and new to the early uh, church fathers. Um, yes, and, and not just Calvin, but most modern uh, Reformed theologians who are uh, our academic understand that. They understand that Augustine is the one who introduced that into Christianity. Uh, it's very interesting that if you look at patristics, there's a book on original sin, and it says the patristic period, and it starts, starts with Augustine. <laughs> Wait a minute, there are 300 years before Augustine. What happened to them? They all taught original sin. But it wasn't the same original sin, so it's rather humorous the way it's presented. <laughs> well, right, there's a video on, on YouTube that did the same kind of thing. In order to, to, to discover what the, the original authors, we've got to go back to the early church fathers, and then the first one they bring up is Augustine. And you're like, yeah. wait a second, what about Tertullian, and what about uh, Polycarp, and what about Ignatius and Irenaeus, and yeah. what, what about all their teachings? Now, did you, in your, in your preparations, did you read through many of these other early church fathers as well? I did. Uh, I have uh, many chapters in my dissertation discussing their views, all talking about original sin, about freedom of will. And the earliest Christians, those guys you just mentioned, um, Irenaeus and Tertullian and Clement, they're all arguing against Stoics and against Manichaeans and Gnostics. They're saying, no, the Christian God is a relational God. He, he in his foreknowledge, knows who's going to respond and who's not. It's not just this arbitrary thing that happens like the Stoics believe and like the Gnostics believe and like the Manichaeans believe. So they're fighting the very thing that Augustine ended up uh, <laughs> putting out there as the truth. Uh, right. That's, right. that's not a coincidence. Now, what were some of the impacts of Augustine's introducing more of a deterministic way of looking at God? Um, historically, how, how did it kind of happen to where the church as a whole, at least the westernized version of the church, kind of falls in line with Augustine? Um, historically, did he just, was he just a better orator? Did he win a, over in public, a, you know, in the court of public opinion? You know, what, what kind of transpired to make the church, at least the church, the more Catholic form of the church at that time, follow in that line of thinking? Yeah, he, he got pushed back immediately when he started those things. Even monks in North Africa rejected his teaching, uh, saying that that just throws away any um, sense of morality and that what we should do and that we're responsible. And so he had immediate pushback. Um, the interesting thing is he was a uh, person who shot down heresies. 
He shot down the Donatist. He shot down the Manichaeans after he became a Christian. And then he was shooting down the Palladians. So you have these, this guy who's really known as a heretic fighter. Well, when he brings in something that's not quite right, people still respect him. Even Jerome did not agree with Augustine. Um, so as he gets a little pushback, uh, even the Pope did not agree with him that at, at infant baptism is salvific when you dump it in the, put the baby in the water. Um, he doesn't agree with that, and they're damned if you don't. So, and the Catholic Church does not believe that today, uh, even though Augustine is the father of the church. So what happens is, since Pelagius, just as you mentioned, is vilified, he's the boogeyman, and so he ends up, anything related to that gets shot down. So the Council of Orange happens years later, and they don't approve all of Augustine's doctrine. They approve an anti-Pelagian stance. Well, that's reasonable. But then it's not until uh, years later when Aquinas picks up Augustine and he massages some of these things to make him still fit into the traditional view. Um, I'm writing a book right now on God's sovereignty, looking at the historical impact all the way from um, Augustine, even before then, all the way up through the modern period and how that happened and, and what we're viewing. But the Catholic Church even to this day, does not readily admit that Augustine taught double predestination, which he does three or four times in his writings. They won't, they won't recognize that because it's, they go to his earlier writings and say, well, look, he believed in free will. Well, yeah, he did back then, but, but in his later writings, he thinks it's worthless. He right. even says, I tried to save free will, but I, God's grace triumphed. I mean... <laughs> Well, people's views do change, as as I, I'm evidence of, uh, having been a you know a five point Calvinist at one point, and uh, my my views change too. So if you looked at my early writings and my early sermons, um, you would come to the conclusion Leighton Flowers uh, believed in Calvinism, but my view changed. Um, I think yeah. you could say the same of probably uh, you know Arminius, for example, probably more Calvinistic in his early teachings and writings, and you know obviously adapted over. Uh, the m maturing in his life. And, and you could say that with Augustine too. It sounds like, you know, if I were mo in a modern day scenario, kind of painting what, what took place, it would be like somebody like maybe Rabbi Zacharias or something known to be kind of a heresy hunter, um, yeah. good at standing up against atheism, good at all these things, but just not in the fray with regard to this particular uh, doctrinal conversation. But then all of a sudden he gets in a debate with somebody who's trying to introduce um, heretical things like Pelagianism is known to to have produced in that time. And all of a sudden, you know, Rabbi Zacharias gets right in the heat of that. And all of us who have a lot of respect for him begin to see, oh my goodness, okay, he's, 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 he's kind of, his pendulum swinging a little too far away from the free will thing into a more deterministic Manichaean Gnostic thing, but I don't know how to call him in on it because, I mean, he's our warrior. Um, yeah. And he's 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 been standing up against all of these things, and he's one of those guys that used to be a Manichaean that's now one of us, and so we want to really hold him up and and, yeah. and champion him champion him as our hero. But now he's he's inching back over into his old Gnosticism, and we don't know what to do about it. That is that kind of a right way to to deal with it. Is that that you think that's kind of what's happening during that time? Um, yeah, there's. It's, it's not uncommon for people to be ignorant of these facts that you and I are discussing, Leighton. And, and I think it's the only way to really understand, if you understand the origins of it. I mean, at the very end of my book, I list all the scriptures used by Manichaeans to support their doctrine. And guess which ones they are? <laughs> <laughs> They're the very ones that Calvinists use today. Is yeah. that a coincidence? No. Um, Augustine... In fact, when he was talking, arguing against Fortunatus, he argued against Ephesians 2 as meaning that God gifted faith. When he was arguing against uh, other Manichaeans, he was saying, no, Romans 9 and 10, that's nothing about God choosing. It's about, about their temporal stuff. I mean, all the arguments he used against the Manichaeans were correct. They were traditional Christian. And then when he flipped, he turns around and uses those very Manichaean interpretations from the same passages. It's wow. it's. It's astonishing. I mean, it's like, wow. Where does John Chrysostom um, fit in the timeline there? So John is, John is a contemporary. Uh, 400 uh, is, I like to I keep it simple for my students. I say 400 is about the time. You know, Augustine, Pelagius, um, 
and, and Chrysostom and Jerome, they're all right in there together about that time period. Right. Because a lot of his writings, he's, he seem, vehemently seem, seems to be fighting against the, the Gnosticism of that day. And Chrysostom is, is abundantly clear about standing up against um, what uh, Augustine goes on to teach, it sounds like. Um, yes. And so besides Chrysostom, is there other heroes, I guess, of, the, of the, the, the free will argument during that time that were really standing up against Augustine or maybe even following Augustine that you would recommend maybe people to, to research and read on? There, there are a lot of them. Um, like you said, uh, John Cassian's one of them. John Chrysostom's one. Uh, Jerome uh, teaches that uh, a viewpoint uh, that the humans still have free will. It's not uh, damned and completely incapable of belief in Christ, uh, that when we're drawn, we can respond uh, out of our own human free will. Uh, it's not something that's gifted of God. So all those people, I mean, if you, if you pick up uh, my book, it just covers everybody. I mean, there's right. nobody else saying what Augustine said. Everybody's saying the other thing. So you just pick anybody, and, and right. they're going to be on the traditional side. Right. Now, obviously, obviously, Augustine's view did get a following. Um, yes. Obviously, I mean, even to this day, you get you get quite a bit of you know people that you could follow through. I don't know where Gottschalk fits in all of there, but I think he was one of the first, according to David Allen, who promoted this concept of limited atonement. Um, yeah. And I don't know if you studied that far and how much further along is that, but there, there's obviously some line, uh, I guess you call it a line of determinism or a deterministic way of thinking um, that followed Augustine and obviously more predominant in the Western world than obviously Eastern Orthodoxy. Talk about that a little bit. Excellent, Layton. So, yeah, the Eastern Orthodox did not even, did not even recognize Augustine as a, a father of the church. Uh, they don't revere him. Uh, because they knew Greek, <laughs> did, did not fit what they saw in Scripture. I mean, quite right. honestly. So uh, you've got the the Gottschalk in 800, and what's really bad is he's unfairly condemned as a heretic for teaching nothing other than what Augustine taught. He interpreted him correctly. He understood him, and he explained him, and he was called a heretic because he wasn't Augustine the heret the heretic fighter. <laughs> he was right. Gottschalk, and right. As I trace this up, I've gone all the way up through the modern period now in this historical survey, and every person who is a determinist quotes Augustine, right? They all get it from Augustine. Uh, he just has this, this pedigree that just keeps on going, except one person, and I'm, I'm not going to give away who it is, but one person did not get it from Augustine. Where did he get it? He was more of a philosopher in the Reformation and went back to the Stoics. <laughs> so oh, wow. he got it directly from the Stoics instead of the, from the Stoics through Augustine. So very interesting. So uh, that, that, that is interesting. Gottschalk was deemed a heretic in his day, but your yes. argument is that he was simply promoting Augustine's later teachings with regard yes. to determinism uh, and, and a lack of free will, or what some may refer to today as compatibilistic free will, which, yeah. which is just another word for determinism. Um, yeah. Because, and let me explain for the listeners, just those that may be tuning in just for this, and, and, and Dr. Wilson, you correct me if this is not correct, but it, it seems to me that what compatibilists are saying is that men are free as long as they do what they want, but what they want is determined by their nature, which is determined from birth by God's decree. Yeah. Um, and that's what Augustine, in your estimation, taught. In other words, they're born yeah. with this fallen nature. That's what you have the babies, you know, corrupted with this guilt. And they are going to be God haters from birth because that's their nature, unless God steps in and changes their nature to make them want God. Yes, um, is that oversimplifying? It? No, no, no. I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, that's a very easy, simple way to, to explain it. That's true. Exactly. So when God's chalk in eight hundred taught it, though, because he wasn't the famous, you know, Augustine, you know, the yes. fighter, he was deemed a heretic uh, yeah. uh, within the church. He was flogged. He was imprisoned. I mean, and we're not talking just to deemed a heretic. I mean, he was he was punished for it. Uh, books burned. Um, it, it's, it's it's like wow. Um, yeah. How do you do it? So. And so when you appeal to history as an authority, then it's it's really depending on which council you want to appeal to. You know, you kill, appeal to the Council of Orange or the Council of Dort or the Council of Nicaea or the, this council, that council, which is one of the reasons that we do want to appeal, obviously, to Scripture as our first and foremost authority, um, because no matter what what view you hold to, you can find some council somewhere that probably supported <laughs> whatever weird view you want to want to support uh, so, exactly <laughs> you know, so 
Um, okay, so backing up a little bit to uh, to Augustinianism and, and kind of its introduction to the church and what, what they believed about God. Um, prior to Augustine, was there any any evidence of debate? I know, I mean, I, we already mentioned John Calvin, even he even has a quote that I put in my book as well as, as in other places, um, where he has a quote saying that the the early church fathers prior to Augustine were confused about this issue and and didn't know what they're talking about and obviously didn't get it right. So Augustine was kind of the first, uh, I think it's Lorraine Botner or Bettner, however you pronounce that, uh, yeah. who's also a Calvinistic historian who admits that Augustine is the first to introduce these things. Was there any other debating among the church fathers, like between Polycarp and Irenaeus or Ignatius and, and other notable um, recognized church fathers that may have said, okay, hey, wait, wait, well, look at Romans 9, guys. This is obviously teaching something about God, you know, sovereignty over our choices. Um, is, is there any evidence of any of those types of people prior to Augustine that you're aware of? Not in the Christian circles. Um, everybody teaches the same thing, which is uh, what I point out in my, in my Oxford thesis. And where in Christianity does everybody agree? I mean, <laughs> that just yeah. doesn't happen. Uh, that's phenomenal that everybody can agree. For four, almost 400 years. Yes. I mean, it's like they all view a general sovereignty of God, like a king controlling a country. He doesn't micromanage everybody's you know, lives. Uh, he's there, and it's not an and they're fighting the dictatorial micromanagement view of Stoicism, Manichaeanism, and Gnosticism. So for all these years, they're saying the same thing until you hit Augustus. There is no debate. And that's commonly known. I mean, the encyclopedias and the big guys who write those uh, point that out, that there was no conflict between human free will and divine sovereignty until Augustine. That's when it started. Now, prior, even during the time of Jesus, and, and, and you know, you Phariseeism, you've got the Sadducees, and you've got the Essians. Now, yes. I've read in some places that the Essians tended to, of those three groups, tended to, to side on the deterministic ways of thinking. Um, exactly. And the Essians were more popular even in Nazareth and the surrounding area where Jesus was actually known in his teaching. Yeah. Um and, and it's interesting, I read this too, that the Essians, uh, it's, it said they kind of went silent for a while there, but it actually connects them to the formation of Gnosticism. Um, yes. And so yeah. talk, is there any, I don't know if you did much study on the Essians, but it seems like that uh, of the, all the lines of deterministic thinking, it would have been through that line of the Essians, which interestingly in the historical were the ones who, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and things like that were found in their qualm and the area that they um, oversee. I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but I just did. I just wondered if you studied any of that that yeah. far back in the history of it. Oh, I, I did. I went I went all the way back to ancient Sumer um, in my thesis. So uh, I spent quite a bit of time uh, on the Qumran community because of that, um, and they believe that God controls the very uh, breath rate, the heartbeat, uh, everything, every little minute thing is controlled. Molecule. Yeah. by God uh, mm -hmm. in that Qumran community. And guess who influenced them? Who's that? Stoicism. Stoicism. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a very definite connection with Stoicism. And the only other Jewish person who we know that t dealt more with the deterministic fashion was Philo of Alexandria. Guess where he was influenced? From Stoicism. So it all points back to the same philosophical idea of Stoicism. It's just phenomenal. But you're right, Qumran was very heavily deterministic. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't want to point fingers, but Eugene Merrill tries to defend them and saying, well, it was based on foreknowledge. That's why God determined. And that is completely untrue. If you read through those works, um, which I did, you'll find out they do not have any room for, for foreknowledge, that they reject foreknowledge as a basis of predetermination. So, right. well, and I've had I've had several conversations with lower forms of Calvinist, and and I would maybe call them inconsistent Calvinist, or maybe people who think they're Calvinist but really don't know what it entails philosophically or even theologically on some levels. But um, where, where they'll say they'll use words that we use with regard to foreknowledge. Well, you know, God knows something's going to happen, and He permits it to happen. That's yes. determinism, and that's what they think determinism is. Um, and we just have to point out that's knowing something's going to happen and not stopping it is not determining something to happen. 
It's it's yeah. knowing something's going to happen and not stopping it. I mean, that's all. That's all it's permitting. It's permission. Yeah. Even which which interestingly, Calvin calls permission something that people invent that are weak willed and childish and vain in order to escape God's uh, meticulous sovereignty over all events. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes it seems that Calvinists today, at least many of them, are borrowing from our vocabulary or borrowing from our language to describe what they think is inevitably the same thing as this kind of this Gnosticistic form of determinism. Um, what, what would you say to some of these who are trying to, in a sense, have their cake and eat it too? They, they want to affirm Calvinistic soteriology, but say, oh, well, we're not determinists. We're, we're not theological determinists. What do you say to, to someone that kind of lands there somehow? Yeah, uh, the debate between foreknowledge and free will and God's sovereignty was going on long before Christ. Um, and Cicero was one that definitely influenced Augustine. And he had to reject foreknowledge in order to get there. So um, I make it pretty simple when I, when I tell my students that the real question is, is foreknowledge causative? Is it causative? Because somebody knows something's going to happen, does that make it happen? Is it, right. Does it is cause it, it to happen? Right. And so I take a book or I take my glasses and I say, all right, given all that gravity is going to work and there are no exceptions in this case, if I let go of these glasses, what's going to happen? Well, <laughs> it's going to fall. It's going to fall, right? right? And so I said, you're right. I drop it. And I said, you just caused those glasses to fall. And you go, wait a minute, <laughs> something's wrong with that picture. And they're right, something's wrong with that picture. Right. Foreknowledge is not causative, it's simply foreknowledge. Right. Well, I loved uh, John Lennox's uh, video on this, where he, he talks about that very thing um, and, and talks about how we don't even know uh, you know, how God created something from nothing. You could say, how did God create something from nothing? We don't know how he did. We know that he did. In the same way, we don't know how God knows every single thing a free creature will choose to do in his life. We don't know how he does it. We know that he does. He knows that. But in his eternal nature, we don't know how he he he, he gets that knowledge. We don't know how he has eternal knowledge. Um, but we can't assume because of our limited, finite way of thinking that because he knows something, he therefore has, quote unquote, determined it, brought it to pass, uh, sovereignly controls it in, the, in, a, in, a, in a, the deterministic way of thinking. Um, but affirming omniscience or affirming that God has knowledge of all things is distinct, very distinct from God, quote unquote, determining, uh, bringing to pass, sovereignly decreeing all things. Um, exactly. and, and that's, that's the distinction. That's the debate that you said has even gone long before even Christ was here on earth. It's been yeah, around forever. Very important, Layton, um, very important to distinguish that omniscience. I like to point out that God is atemporal, optemporal, that he is living in the past and the present and the future all simultaneously. There is no foreknowledge to God. I mean, that's a human anthropomorphism. It's a term we right. use. To think of I like have looking into the future, right. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he's living at all. So uh, again, when you look at does God cause something to happen, um, nobody believed he caused everything to happen except the Stoics and the Gnostics and the Manichaeans, uh, those groups, Christians, again, held to a general sovereignty, uh, that he didn't plan every detail of the universe to happen as the way he wanted to happen. He gave freedom, that he gave, this is gonna happen, I'm gonna prophesy this through my prophets, this will happen, but everything else, I'm gonna give some flexibility here. Uh, right. That was the view that was held. So just because, as you said, omniscience does not imply ordaining, foreordaining, or planning everything that's going to happen. Well, I think that sometimes the mindset is, well, if I can't imagine how he does it, then it must be that he can't. Um, and, and that's where I think it's a lower view of sovereignty uh, from the Calvinistic perspective than from our perspective, because we're, we're actually saying God's sovereign enough, or he's, he's so powerful that he's able to bring about his plans despite the free choices of creatures. He doesn't have to control all the choices of creatures in order to bring about his plans. He can he can bring about his plans despite the fact that they all have free choices, um, and that's that seems to me to be a lot higher view of of sovereignty than than what the, our deterministic friends are are attempting to promote. Exactly. I mean, Irenaeus made that exact argument in 180 A.D. He said, "Oh that man, the I thought I was original with me. I thought I came up with that." 
Darn. <laughs> the, the Gnostic God is a puny God, you know, puny God, because he has to have everything exactly his way. And Irenaeus argues, well, wait a minute. Here's a God who's so big that he can let preachers have free will and still get exactly what he wants done. Um, he didn't use this analogy, but I compare it to a chess player, a master chess player playing a four-year-old. He can let that <laughs> they even do illegal moves, and he's still going to win the chess match. Yeah, uh, There's yeah. no competition. And so when God does that, it's the same view. And Aris, and Aris makes that argument. Our God's a bigger God. Yeah. Christian God's a bigger God. Um, Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, I had read, some, I think it was Leo James Leo Garrett's uh, Systematic Theology, where he makes the point that in uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, this debate doesn't, it's 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 it doesn't even exist hardly, um, which is also just it's like that first three hundred years or four hundred years of church history. This this debate can't be found really, yes. um, and and in Eastern Orthodoxy, it's almost the exact same way. You just you don't find this this parsing of of Romans nine and back and forth and determinism all that. But in Western, obviously in Western Christianity, you find it all over the place. Um, wh why is that? Why is Eastern Orthodoxy, though it has its other issues, obviously every every stream of Christian thought, because it's made up of human beings and sinful human beings, that that's going to have its problems. But why is it that Eastern Orthodoxy, it's just like this debate or this issue almost virtually doesn't exist? Um, good question, Layton. So it's because they didn't incorporate Augustine. <laughs> If, if we took Augustine out of Western Christianity, we would not be having this debate, right? It's that simple. So they did not recognize, recognize him as a church father. They kept all the first 300 years of the teachings on who God is and the human free will and how he relates uh, with a general sovereignty. And so there, there's never been a problem. Uh, they're, they're still reading the scriptures as the earliest Christians read them. Uh, we're only in the West having trouble because... We're reading them as the Manichaeans read them uh, through Augustine. Huh. Well, what warning would you just based upon your own studies? What um, you know, students obviously listen to this. We've got a lot of people who are in school and in seminary or pastors. Um, uh, of course, we've we've got PhDs and others who listen to the program. But what what advice would you give for those who are wanting to know more, to study more? Um, maybe maybe get, give us the name of your book for one, where they can find it, and then also other resources that would help somebody that really wants to go back and study for themselves. They want to be good Bereans in the sense of saying, hey, I'm not going to take Dr. Wilson's word for it. I want to go read all this yeah. stuff for myself. What advice would you give them? Um, sure. Well, my book's a good starting uh, point. It's way too expensive, uh, written by Moore Seebeck, published by them. Uh, it's The easy way is Wilson and then Augustine's conversion. You remember okay. Wilson and Augustine's conversion, you Google that, it'll come up. Okay. But the full title is Augustine's Conversion from Traditional Free Choice to Non-Free Free Will. Non-Free Free Will is a Stoic term. Compatibilism, <laughs> in other yes, words. Yes. Exactly. So, um, so they can start there, and that will give you, I mean, it has all the references there, so you can go back and look them all up. You can look at the original writings, and that's what I did. So that's all available the problem is there's nothing else that's been written like this. Uh, this is the first time that that's come out and, and this be exposed in this way in a scholarly manner. So they're going to have trouble finding other things, but if you, if you pick that up, you're going to be able to research all you want uh, on those references and check my references and see that I handled them fairly. I mean, nobody's argued that I haven't handled them fairly. Right. Now, there have been some Calvinists along the way. I think Michael Horton... In one of his books, had a list of uh, early church fathers where quotes were taken, and and they were uh, you you are nodding as if you may be aware of, of some of this. Um, yeah. What's your response to some of those that do quote early church fathers? Uh, I, I had this tr trouble with James White in my debate where I I, I quote from Clement of Rome, um, and and he says, well, Clement speaks of the elect several times, and yeah. as, as if speaking of the elect automatically makes you a Calvinist. Uh, I'm not sure how that, that flows, but um, but anyway, speak to that. I mean, what about those who, sure. who do have lists of quotes from early church fathers that claim they're Calvinistic supporting? Well, well, they're not. Uh, and if you go back and actually read the entire work, <laughs> you'll understand that. When, when you take one little snippet, you can make that say anything. But just like using the word predestination. I mean, a lot of them use predestination. 
That doesn't mean they're Calvinists. They <laughs> they understood biblical predestination. So we're incorporating our own understanding and meaning into those terms and saying, oh, well, they must be a Calvinist when they weren't at all. And they were absolutely not. Right. Uh, if, if you read the whole context and not just take a little quote, there's nobody who can come away saying, well, this person was a Calvinist. You cannot find them before Augustine. Yeah. And then that's been my experience. Um, every time I've, I've gotten a, you know, somebody sent me a link, hey, look at here, Tertullian said this, look, he must have been a Calvinist. And of course, I've got 15 other quotes from Tertullian that obviously support free will. And I'm going, no, that must not say what they're thinking it means. Yeah, and even in yeah. first reading, some of them, the way they, 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 they show it to me, it does sound like it supports Calvinism. I, I read it and I would go, oh my goodness, that does sound like it supports Calvinism. What, what is he saying? And then I'd go back and read it and find out, one, it's a translation. So every yeah. translation is an interpretation. So if you're translating yeah. something from Greek or from you know any other language, obviously you have some liberty as to how you translate the words. But then secondly, it's the context. Um, and in this particular one, it he was quoting, this is what's so funny about it, he was quoting from a Gnostic source in order to rebut it later in his in his writing. And so it was like, that was an easy one for me. I was going, uh, he was actually citing a, a Gnostic source to confront it, and the guy just went silent, and he never responded to me again. Um, so is, has that been it your experience? Point, yeah, it does. It was a really good point. Um, so has that been your experience? I mean, when you be really – when you when you get something quoted at you, you can proof text Charlie Church Fathers just like you can proof text the scripture. Um, that that people who try to make their system uh, look like it's more robust than it really is, or more supported than it really is, when they resort to things like proof texting early church fathers, who obviously, when you read them in their context, supported the concept of libertarian free will that we hold to. Um, yeah. What's your warning against that? I mean, what do you say to people who want to almost rewrite history in order to make their system look more palatable and believable? Well, it's definitely not fair. Uh, they're being uh, dishonest uh, by doing that. Um, I spent a year uh, doing nothing but starting uh, with Clement of Rome in 95 AD uh, and reading all the way through the early church fathers. But what did they have to say? Um, at Oxford, just just read, 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 read them all. I mean, I was working 12 hours a day, six days a week uh, reading. Uh, so if you do that, if, if you're really honest about it, actually read the whole section and understand it in its context and learn Latin, learn Greek so you can read it and not get a translation. And then you'll see that those quotes are, are misrepresented. Um, mm. It's very simple once you understand. Now, did you ever find yourself like reading along and, and, and you did come across something that sounded like it was more deterministic leaning or maybe a church father that sounded like they supported it and then and then you had to read a little bit further? Because some people, I could, I, I'm trying to put myself in the, the, the shoes of a Calvinist maybe watching this. They may think, oh, well, Dr. Wilson is biased because he's obviously wanting to support or wanting to find because um, a lot of times when you're wanting to find evidence, you can go searching for that evidence, and then you just ignore the parts that don't support you. Um, and so, when you were going back as you were reading through this, did you did you did you find yourself um, having a bias to say, hey, "I'm looking for the free will stuff. I'm just going to skip over anything that doesn't sound like it supports my view," or were you objective in really studying both sides uh, from you know from both perspectives to try to find? The, the true meaning and, and intention of the author. Sure, Layton. I mean, I didn't know. When, when I started this, I had no clue what these guys were were saying and what was going on. So it was very simple. All I did was categorize them and say, okay, I'm read, I've read the whole thing. Here's what this person says. Here's what this person says and why. And so it was not a, a search for, hey, i got to prove free will against Augustine. It's what did these people say and, and how do I know? So if you read them objectively, um, that's what you're going to find. It's not a matter of, of leaving out determinism because you cannot find it. Uh, it's just not there. They're fighting determinism, not yeah. promoting it. Right. Well, and, and, and the fact that Sam Storms, who is a leading Calvinist, it's a part of Piper's ministry out of Oklahoma. Um, you've got Lorraine Botner that we already mentioned, Calvin himself, uh, and many other, I, mean, I know, Reformed slash Calvinistic teachers who actually say, the same thing. Uh, they actually say that Augustine was the first to clearly articulate these views. Um, it, that coupled with what you found, it seems to be an insurmountable uh, argument against a more deterministic understanding of the text. 
Yes, if you want to remain a traditional Christian. If, if you want to go uh, be a Manichaean Christian with Augustine, um, then it's fine to, to take a deterministic view. But for a traditional Christian, you should hold a free will view. Traditionalism. Hey, there you go. It's not traditionalism of the SBC. We're talking about historical traditionalism, the yes. tradition of the church. We're, we're, uh, so you don't call us a traditionalist. We're talking about the tradition of the first 300 years of the Christian exactly. church. That's right. right. Well, Dr. Wilson, thank you for your time. Um, I appreciate you taking, I know you have a busy schedule being an orthopedic surgeon um, and, and traveling and, and, and thank you for what you do. Thank you for this, this teaching. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing more. I, I don't know if you're, you're ever game for something like this, but um, our generation, unfortunately, is not real good about reading large, thick dissertations, uh, yeah. but they're really good about reading small manuals or small books popularized. Um, yeah. That if you ever sat down and took maybe some of the best and most uh, poignant points of your dissertation and put it in a in a book, I know Trinity College of the, the Bible and Theological Seminary, Trinity Seminary would probably publish it for you if you if nobody else would. But yeah. um, that that kind of thing could be, I think, real valuable to the church to have just an easy, uh, popular uh, teaching on the doctrines of Augustine and historical teachings. Um, I don't know. I know you're busy. You have surgeries to do and all that stuff, that little nonsense stuff, if you want to save people's lives and all. But if, if you want to stop and, uh, and pare something down into a popular book, I know there would be probably people interested in publishing it. Thanks. That's a good idea. I may, uh, <laughs> may end up doing that. Uh, more CPEC should, should allow me to summarize something because um, it won't be as scholarly, obviously, but uh, maybe sure. people will yeah. Yeah, more popular level. Well, thank you, Dr. Wilson, for your time. I appreciate it so much. God bless you, my friend. You too, lady. Take care. Awesome. I loved it. <laughs> that's a great, that's going to be a Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.